Now I want to start with uh, introduce glyphosate, and here's the big picture. It's the active ingredient in the herbicide Roundup, which is pervasive in our food supply. Uh, people use it in their yards. It's considered to be safe for humans, but there's increasing doubt that this is true. Glyphosate kills weeds by suppressing an enzyme in the shikimate pathway called EPSP synthase, and our gut bacteria use this enzyme to make essential aromatic amino acids for the host. And of course, the gut bacteria get harmed by glyphosate, and then uh, this causes gut dysbiosis, which is a major underlying problem associated with many mon modern diseases. There are strong correlations between the rise in glyphosate usage in the United States and the rise in a number of different neurological, oncological, autoimmune, and metabolic diseases. And this a paper by Nancy Swanson shows all kinds of plots of correlations between glyphosate and diseases. Here's my new book. They already talked about it earlier. It was released by Chelsea Green in July, 2021. I, I present extensive data on glyphosate's toxicity to animals and humans from the research literature. And I show how glyphosate disrupts sulfate homeostasis, which is the link to autism and to many other diseases, by the way. And I argue that glyphosate is insidiously cumulatively toxic through its diabolical insertion into proteins by mistake in place of the coding amino acid glycine. And this is critical, and I will say more about this throughout this talk to explain exactly what I mean by that and the effects of it. And this explains why it has a, a very unusual toxic effect on, on the body to cause all kinds of different diseases. So my next topic is NADPH, um, which is essential to support the mitochondria. And here's again, the big picture. This is uh, NAD is nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, and it's an essential cofactor in oxidation reduction reactions. And it exists in four forms, it, which it can have a hydrogen, it can have a phosphate. So you have NAD plus, NADH, NADP plus, and NADPH. And you can see no H, no P, has the H, but no P. Then you can have both, uh, both the H and the P with the NADPH. And the enzymes that supply NAD plus and NADP plus with H are all specially designed to avoid deuterium. So the H here is a very valuable H and the mitochondria take advantage of it by pouring that H into the intermembrane space to drive uh, as a driving force behind the generation of ATP. So these mitochondria, they, they, they supply the energy to the cell in the form of ATP. They depend critically on a proton ATPase pump to make it. And the protons derived from NADH and NADPH are major sources of the protons to drive that pump. Deuterium gums up the pump like sugar in the gas tank and glyphosate interferes with the supply of NADH and NADPH to the organism in multiple ways. So here's just a picture of mitochondria. And, you know, these are these, there's many of them in the cells. Neurons and muscles have more than other cells. They have a membrane, they're separate units. They have this intermembrane space is this pale blue. And then the, the, the blue green inside is the matrix, the, the, the mitochondrial matrix. And that's where a lot of the activity takes place. Protons are pumped into this intermembrane space, and then they come back out, and they, they're the driving force that causes these ATPase pumps to produce the ATP as the proteins are coming back out of the intermembrane space. So here's a picture of the uh, membrane. So um, you have the uh, matrix in here, and the intermembrane space here, and this is the cytoplasm up here. And so these, you can see these NADHs, and FADH2 is an intermediary that's also very, very important. These two are supplying those protons that are deuterium depleted and pumping them up into the intermembrane space. And then they pour back out here where you have this pump ready to make uh, the ATP. And so um, you can see the hydrogens come in and then they all pour back out naturally as an, because of the gradient that's been created by the pumping in. Very, very critical part of uh, mitochondria. This water that's produced from oxygen in the, at the same time as the ATP is produced is deuterium depleted water because it's using these protons that have been produced through this NADPH process. So here's a picture, again, cytoplasm out here, the intermembrane space, all these protons kind of gathering here at these ATPase pumps that are in these Christi that come in, 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 in vaginations into the mitochondrial matrix. These pumps are gonna get messed up by the deuterium. And, um, and that's gonna cause, first of all, an inefficient make, uh, production of ATP and uh, reactive oxygen species. And that is a big deal because mitochondria get sick. When they have too many reactive oxygen species, they get sick. So uh, this is a fascinating paper by this guy, Olgan from 2007. There are around 15,000 ATPase pumps in a single mitochondria and the numbers are, are mind boggling. Proton force rotates these pumps at a rate of a thousand cycles per second. Deuterons get in the way. This is this deuteron here. They resist letting go. They stall the pump. They produce a stutter, and that causes a, react, a release of these reactive oxygen species. And so they, um, 
they d- disrupt this proton coupled electron transport. And this is a biophysical mechanism by which you can select protons over um, deuterons in the whole process of making all this run smoothly. And the deuterons will totally mess that up. So it causes decreased production of ATP and increased production of reactive oxygen species damaging the pumps. Now, this is uh, interesting here. This is a little bit of an aside here, but you have this uh, enzyme, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. Many people have mutations in it. It's a troublesome enzyme that doesn't always work the way it should. It's an important enzyme for producing the H, NADPH, which has this safe H that's not D. Um, So this is also NADPH is the largest source of hydrogen during fatty acid synthesis in biology. And so when when you buy something like chlorella, which is known to be sort of a healthy fat, you're buying a deuterium depleted nutrient because these animals, these, these microbes produce depleted, during deuterium depleted, depleted fatty acids because of this G6PD, which is able to select hydrogen over deuterium to make this NADPH. And so these, um, these fats that are produced by these photosynthetic organisms such as chlorella are very healthy fats. So fatty acids are a preferred fuel for the mitochondria because they are deuterium depleted. This makes fat a healthy food choice. So now glyphosate, glycine, and flavoproteins, and here again is the big picture. Flavoproteins are an important class of proteins that transfer hydrogens to and from NADPH using flavins, FAD, FMN, as intermediaries. And so they have these, they, they bind to both the FAD and the NAD or NADP. And glyphosate's disruption of the chicken mate pathway in gut microbes leads to a deficiency in tryptophan, which is a precursor. That's one of the aromatic amino acids that get disrupted. It's a precursor to NAD. So that's going to become deficient if the microbes can't make enough tryptophan. And tryptophan is also a precursor to serotonin, which is the feel-good hormone. And that may be the connection between um, glyphosate and depression and also between uh, deuterium and depression, excess deuterium you might link all of this to, in fact, the violent behavior may also be in those mice that were exposed to high levels of deuterium could have had the violent behavior because of serotonin deficiency linked to excess deuterium. Um, My research strongly suggests that glyphosate suppresses enzymes that bind phosphate. So not just glycine substitution, but glycine substitution in specific places. And I wrote about that in my book. Um, I wrote about the flavoproteins and I wrote about the sulfur system. Both of them are getting disrupted by glyphosate um, because these enzymes that do this all bind phosphate, NAD, and of course the extra P here, NADP has even more, NAD, FAD, and FMN all contain multiple phosphate anions, and the enzyme has to bind to those phosphates at sites where glycine is highly conserved. And so um, this gives them, these flavoproteins, a tremendous susceptibility to glyphosate's mischief through glycine substitution for those glycines in the protein. So here's my hypothesis, glyphosate disrupts proteins that bind phosphate, and it kills plants by suppressing EPSP synthase. This enzyme binds phosphate in PEP, phosphoenol pyruvate, at a site where there's a highly conserved glycine molecule. Whoops, I have to go back there, sorry. Um, glyphosate is also a glycine molecule, but it has an extra methyl phosphonate unit attached to it, which is this thing down here. And so um, attached to its nitrogen atom. And so the binding site for PEP has a highly conserved glycine And there's room for the phosphate in the substrate that's reserved by the way the enzyme shapes, but glyphosate occupies that spot. So here's sodium phosphate and here's sodium methyl phosphonate. You can see they're very, very similar. So glyphosate fits very nicely into the spot that was reserved for the phosphate of the substrate. And now the substrate can't fit. And this is what I think is happening in all of these enzymes that bind phosphate. And there are many, many enzymes that are crucial for biology that bind phosphate, and they're all going to get disrupted by glyphosate uh, because of glyphosate getting into the protein and blocking the binding of phosphate. So the unit fits nicely in the pocket that's reserved for phosphate binding, uh, blocking the phosphate binding. So this is just a pretty picture of these water molecules and these water wires, which are so cool. And they're, they're, it, there's, it, it's a basis of one of the mechanisms by which these enzymes keep uh, deuterium out. And the water molecules actually are the, these, these um, flavoproteins have this hydrophobic region that allows just a handful of water molecules, like 12, and they line up inside this cavity that's created by the protein, and they can pass hydrogen from one another. And so this is what's happening here. There's a hydrogen coming in, which makes this one have an extra hydrogen. This is a water molecule, but it has one extra hydrogen coming in, and then it kicks off one of its own, and each of them picks up a new one, kicks one off until it comes out over here. So down below, you now have three hydrogens over here and only two over here. It's moved through 
by passing hydrogens along through this water wire. And that results in, by the time you get over here, this hydrogen is almost guaranteed not to be deuterium because the, these water molecules, even if they had deuterium to begin with, they wouldn't want to pass it. So it's a way of uh, assuring that deuterium ends up on the other side. And, and the flavoproteins use this mechanism in their design of their enzyme. To, and they have to bind the flavin, flavin in order for this whole thing to work. So I want to talk a bit about succinate dehydrogenase, a very important enzyme in the um, in the mitochondria. And this enzyme actually plays a role in both oxidative phosphor, uh, phosphorylation, which is what makes the ATP, and in the citric acid cycle, which is what breaks down the glucose and all the nutrients uh, to turn it, it into water and carbon dioxide. So this is a, a flavoprotein and it extracts two protons from succinate, its, its substrate, and then it embeds them in the membrane uh, in, in the form of ubiquinol. So this is coenzyme Q10, which many people take as a supplement, very important molecule in the mitochondria for keeping them uh, working properly. And it picks up these two protons through this enzyme, and those protons are almost guaranteed not to be deuterons. And so when you have a genetic mutation, it's like succinate dehydrogenase, you, you can run a risk of getting cancer. Many of the cancers, you can see this list of cancers, neuroblastoma, breast cancer, colon cancer, renal cancer, melanoma, uterine cancer, prostate cancer, endometrial cancer, bladder cancer, gastrointestinal, stromal tumor, all these things are connected to uh, deficiencies in succinate dehydrogenase. So here is a, a bit of uh, biochemistry about succinate dehydrogenase. It has this particular motif, it's called a motif, of a GX, GXXG motif, which is a classic motif for flavoproteins. And in the case of succinate dehydrogenase, it's GAG, GGAG. So it's four glycines here. Um, and this shows the sort of, this is where you can represent sort of statistically what the, what the different versions of the enzyme might look like. Um, and down here is where it's binding, FAD, FAD, NAD. These are all these uh, uh, molecules that are binding the phosphates. So over here is FAD. You can see it has these two phosphates right here. And those two phosphates, these P's here, is where it's binding, right around these three glycines, which are highly, highly conserved. So when you change these glycines into something else, the protein breaks. It doesn't work. It doesn't bind FAD. And uh, you get into a lot of trouble. And of course, you can't deliver the deuterium-depleted protons to the uh, mitochondria. And now the studies have shown that glyphosate suppresses succinate dehydrogenase, which is no surprise to me because it perfectly fits what I call my glyphosate susceptibility motif. And so this study on, on E. coli proteins, proteins found that it's significantly suppressed by three to four fold, three different components of this high, succinate dehydrogenase complex. And a, a study on, on rat liver mitochondria in isolation exposed to Roundup, they found that Roundup, um, in this exposure experiment, Roundup affected the, um, the succinate dehydrogenase, but glyphosate did not. And they suspected that was because the surfactants in Roundup were necessary to help the glyphosate to get transported across these mitochondrial membranes. And, when they, and another paper that analyzed the mechanism of glyphosate suppression suggested that it disrupts binding of succinate dehydrogenase, dehydrogenase to FAD. And that's exactly what I would expect given my glyphosate susceptibility motif theory. Uh, here's another paper that shows glyphosate formulations induce apoptosis and necrosis, which is you know, different kinds of death in human umbilical, embryonic, and placental cells, three different cell types. And they showed that the key mechanism was through suppression of succinate dehydrogenase. And over here, you can see this is SD, is succinate dehydrogenase, glyphosate coming in and disrupting it, and therefore messing up the mitochondria in a big way. And here's another one uh, paper that shows that it suppresses NADPH reductase. So that's going to be a problem uh, for getting back that H, that healthy H. This is the enzyme that supplies NADPH to the enzyme aromatase, which is an important enzyme that converts testosterone to estrogen. And this is aromatase deficiency is connected to, to uh, autism. It's sort of like a super male brain. There's too much testosterone, not enough estrogen because this enzyme is being disrupted by glyphosate. And this uh, chart from this paper just shows that the reductase activity goes way down when you increase the concentration uh, related to the concentration of glyphosate with two different pH conditions. And so this enzyme is not only for, for the, uh, this uh, enzyme, NADPH reductase is, is a necessary, not only for arom aromatase, but for all these different cytochrome P450 enzymes that are involved in many, many different um, reactions. So, and then in my book, I talk about other things, other uh, enzymes that I found in the research literature, glyphosate suppressed them. So we have the succinate dehydrogenase, the NADPH reductase, but also um, cytochrome P450 enzymes, all, all of them seem to be suppressed by glyphosate. NAD transhydrogenase, which is an interesting enzyme that transfer the transfers the hydrogen from NAD to NADP, 
And I mentioned G6PD before, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, and also Rubisco, which also binds phosphate, and it is the most common enzyme in the world, and plants use it uh, in photosynthesis. So it's actually interesting to me that Rubisco is suppressed by glyphosate, because I suspect that could be hurting the carbon footprint, because you, you, pulling carbon dioxide out of the air to make organic matter is what these plants do, and they need Rubisco to do that. And so I suspect glyphosate is playing a role in climate change for that reason. Mm -hmm.